II was both a war and a crime. Millions of innocent people were killed, and millions more lost their homes and property. The victims cried out for justice. Those who brought this suffering must be made to answer for their crimes. After World War I, the Allies had decided in the peace treaty that people accused of war crimes should be tried. And one of the many concessions made to the Germans after the First World War was a change which the Allies had agreed to in the Versailles Treaty, that the Germans would try these criminals themselves. Well, that proved an absolute and total fiasco. And uh, the Allies were not about to try that a second time. Near the end of the war, the Allies organized a war crimes commission and set up a system for bringing criminals to justice. The commission decided that individuals who committed atrocities against persons or property would return for trial near the scene of their crime. Individuals accused of specific crimes, like killing prisoners of war or downed airmen, would be brought before military courts. An international tribunal would try the major war criminals, Hitler and the men of his inner circle. But Hitler, Joseph Goebbels, and other high-ranking Nazis committed suicide before they could be arrested. The notion that there ought to be a trial under international law took hold and was really exemplified by Justice Jackson, Robert Jackson, who took leave from our Supreme Court and strongly advocated running a trial which, in my view, had lots of merit, because if nothing else, it was going to establish, forgetting the legal aspects of it, it was going to establish the Nazi record in an indelible fashion, which would not be open to controversy. Truman asked Justice Jackson to serve as chief prosecutor of the Nazi war criminals in Nuremberg in 1945. Defying the preferences of his colleagues on the court, Jackson agreed to do this task. The other justices thought his absence left the court shorthanded and that no other assignment should be accepted by a sitting member of the court. But Justice Jackson recognized the enormous importance of a successful effort to collect evidence and expose to the world the extent and the enormity of the Holocaust. The first of 13 Nuremberg trials commenced six months after the war ended. In November 1945, American Chief Prosecutor Robert Jackson arrived in Germany with the hope that the trials would destroy the lingering attraction of Nazi ideology forever. On the second day of the trial, Jackson stood before the court and delivered the opening statement on behalf of the international team of prosecutors. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. The most important of the Nazi conspirators was Hermann Goering, who had been Hitler's number two. Goering was indicted on all four counts, from planning aggressive war to crimes against humanity. First, did you proclaim the Nuremberg Laws? As Reichstag's president, jawohl. Eheschließungen zwischen Juden und Staatsangehörigen Deutschen oder auch verwandten Blutes sind verboten. That was the beginning of the legal measures taken against the Jews, was it not? Das war eine legale Maßnahme. 
I assume that uh, that is the only kind of government that you... Goering dominated the proceedings for three days. His aim was to put on record a defense of the Nazi regime. Under den damaligen Umständen war sie nach meiner Auffassung die einzig mögliche Form und sie hat auch gezeigt, dass Deutschland aus seinem tiefen Elend der Verarmung und Arbeitslosigkeit in kurzer Zeit zu einer verhältnismäßigen Blüte wieder gekommen war. I trust the court is not unaware uh, that outside of this courtroom is a great social question of the revival of Nazism and that one of the purposes here of the defendant Gehring, I think he'd be the first to admit, is to revive and perpetuate. Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, the chief prosecutor for the United States, prepares to examine Dr. Jarmar Schock, Nazi finance minister. Dr. Schock, you said in 1938, we have fallen into the hands of criminals. How could I ever have suspected that? I'm sure you would want to help the tribunal by telling us who those criminals were. Hitler and his comrades. I'm asking you to name all that you included in that category of criminals at that time. Hitler, you know, is dead. Defendant Goering. I might also include Himmler and Bormann. As to the other members of that uh, intimate circle, I do not know who they were. You've named four men as criminals, three of whom are dead and one of whom you say admitted. I might add one more name. I suppose that Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop knew of the plans of Hitler constantly. Von Ribbentrop displays shock over this repeated violation of the prevailing strategy of Nuremberg defense to lay all misdeeds at the door of men beyond the reach of the court. The judges make some last notes as the trial approaches its end. On August 29th, 1946, the chief American prosecutor, Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson, comes forward for his final summation. These men saw no evil, spoke none, and none was uttered in their presence. When we put all of their stories together, this is the ridiculous composite picture of Hitler's government that emerges. It was composed of a number two man who knew nothing of the excesses of the Gestapo which he created. A number three man who was merely an innocent middleman transmitting Hitler's orders without even reading them like a postman or a delivery boy. A foreign minister who knew little of foreign affairs and nothing of foreign policy. A security chief who was of the impression that the policing functions of his Gestapo and SD were somewhat on the order of directing traffic. A party philosopher who was interested in historical research and had no idea of the violence which his philosophy was inciting in the 20th century. Now this may seem like a fantastic exaggeration, but this is what you would actually be obliged to conclude if you were to acquit these defendants. If you were to say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say that there has been no war, that there are no slaves, that there has been no crime. After 10 months in this place and 17,000 transcript pages of testimony, 19 of 21 defendants were convicted and sentenced. As Jackson put it, the evidence is there with such authenticity and in such detail that there can be no responsible denial of these crimes in the future and no tradition of martyrdom of the Nazi leaders can arise among informed people. And he hoped to create a precedent that would make explicit that to persecute, oppress, and do violence to individuals or to minorities on political, racial, or religious grounds is an international crime. 
Today, 50 plus years later, the world is again witnessing an attempt to apply that precedent in new war crimes proceedings in Brussels and in Rwanda to serve again as the voice of human decency following the unspeakable atrocities in Rwanda and in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We're following the path beaten by Robert Jackson for the protection of basic human liberties. One of the prosecutors assisting Justice Robert H. Jackson at Nuremberg is our guest tonight, Whitney R. Harris. Whitney Harris was admitted to the practice of law in Los Angeles in 1936. When World War II broke out, he entered the Navy as a line officer, serving initially in the Pacific and eventually on the staff of the Office of Strategic Services, investigating war crimes in the European theater of war. He was ultimately assigned to the staff of Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson, the chief American prosecutor at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, Germany in 1945 and 46. Mr. Harris was responsible for developing and arguing the case against the Gestapo and the SD. Whitney Harris has been a leading supporter in the establishment of the Robert H. Jackson Center. He is an advocate for the role international law should play in addressing war and in the crimes related to it. He has spoken many times about his friendship with and respect for the man he worked for at Nuremberg, Robert H. Jackson. In an action unprecedented in the history of the Supreme Court of the United States, Associate Justice Robert H. Jackson took leave of the court pursuant to an executive order of May 8, 1945 to accept the appointment by President Harry Truman as the representative of the United States and as its chief of counsel in preparing and prosecuting charges of atrocities and war crimes against such of the leaders of the European Axis powers and their principal agents and accessories as the United States may agree with any of the United Nations to bring to trial before an international military tribunal. Thus began a period of agonizing effort and brilliant achievement that caused Justice Jackson to conclude his 1954 introduction to tyranny on trial with these words. His manuscript teaches me that the hard months at Nuremberg were well spent in the most important, enduring, and constructive work of my life.